I'd like to introduce you to the F Element project, which is uh, actually the longest running project in GEP, uh, based on work from my lab, from the Modern Code Consortium, and the uh, GEP students themselves. I'll show you data from all of those groups. Now, I want to spend some time on the context. Why should you be interested in the F Element, which is also known as the dot chromosome or the fourth chromosome in Drosophila melanogaster? Well, really all starts with the C-value paradox. Why do eukaryotes have such large genomes? The human genome is a thousand times larger than the E. coli genome, even though only, we only have uh, four or five times as many genes. Uh, this puzzled people for quite a while, <clears throat> uh, but we eventually realized that the bulk of the uh, eukaryotic genome, the human genome shown here, does not code for genes. In fact, only about 5% at most can be considered coding uh, for genes or conserved regulatory sequences. The vast majority of your genome is made up of transposable elements, retroviruses, DNA transposons, and remnants from those. So <clears throat> people have struggled with this for some time. Should this DNA be considered junk or garbage? Garbage would be what you put out on the curb for the garbage men to take away, that if we could have gotten this stuff out of our genome, we would have. Um, we just failed for some reason. But junk is what you put in the garage or the attic because you're going to use it at some point. And we now know <laughs> enough to know that um, <clears throat> indeed we have used the transposable element uh, sequences to evolve uh, a very sophisticated genome. But there's a downside to this. Transposable elements, as their name implies, are, are mobile, at least in their original form. They can jump around in your genome. If they insert in a gene, they will damage it in most cases. So we have to silence uh, this portion of our genome while still allowing the genes to be transcribed in an appropriate way. And if I could answer how that's done, I would die happy. Um, but, you know, it's probably not going to happen in my lifetime. Um, I'm older than you guys. Uh, so silencing is absolutely critical to maintaining the somatic genome. The loss of silencing is linked to health problems of, of aging. For example, L1, a retrovirus, is 21% of your genome. I really try and, and uh, lay this on the kids as an existential problem, and it, it gives them some pause. If uh, this becomes active, if it's mobile, if it's, so the genes are expressed, it can drive inflammation, uh, that uh, TE moving around uh, can be responsible for mutations leading to cancer. Uh, I'll have a, a lecture with slides on it that's devoted entirely to this yin-yang problem, uh, because what we see now that we have sequenced genomes is that in fact our transposable elements have been really important to making us what we are. The TEs form the basis for developing centromeres and telomeres. Without them, we wouldn't have linear chromosomes. They mark sex chromosomes, making that distinction that's so important for our genetics. Uh, and they can mark groups of genes to be coordinated for gene expression. Okay, uh, but silencing uh, has got to be essential. And it has struck me over the years that this capacity to silence may be critical also to our evolution in the sense that it allows for differential gene expression, differentiated cells, which is, of course, the essence of a eukaryote. And looking at our genomes, we have to remember that whatever works survives, even if the results appear more complex than logically necessary. And quite frankly, I currently think of eukaryotic genomes as a Rube Goldberg device illustrated here, a complex machine for a simple outcome, survival. But uh, I suggest to the students that without our transposable elements and our histones, we would be bacteria. Uh, and that also gives them some pause for thought. <clears throat> okay, so how can we understand the, our capacity to silence? Um, this capacity really hit home uh, in a different way in the 1990 when Rich Jorgensen did the following experiment. He wanted to get a really dark petunia, almost a black flower, if you will. So he put in an extra copy of the gene that codes for the purple pigment in this petunia. Did he get darker purple? Nope. He got variegating flowers. He got white flowers. What was going on? 
Well, clearly what happened, and we now know, uh, is that the cell realized that the gene for purple pigment was now repeated. It became visible as a repetitious sequence. And that is the trigger for silencing. That's a, a characteristic of these retrotransposons and transposable elements. They come in, they want to, to multiply, they do multiply, they're repetitious. Uh, and clearly being repetitious uh, is a trigger for silencing. How do we do it? Uh, by forming heterochromatin structure. So now we segue into thinking about uh, chromatin structure. And I do think this pro the underpinnings of this project allow you to introduce a number of important concepts in terms of thinking about eukaryotic genes and genomes. All the DNA in eukaryotes is packaged up in a nucleosome array. Uh, and this is true uh, for all of the DNA in, in your genome across the board, okay? Uh, that is the first step. The second step is differential packaging. And I focus with the students on this distinction between heterochromatin and euchromatin. These are different packaging states that were first recognized cytologically. If you stain a eukaryotic cell with a dye that binds to DNA, you'll find that you have some relatively diffuse areas. Those are called euchromatin and some relatively uh, highly stained areas implying a compact, higher concentration of DNA spatially. And those are referred to as heterochromatin. So the starting distinction was cytological. We then uh, uh, discovered uh, various features of the cell biology of these two different states. Heterochromatin tends to be replicated late in S and shows no meiotic recombination clearly a relatively condensed form found at centromeres, telomeres, any place where you have a high density of repeats. So heterochromatic domains <clears throat> tend to be gene poor, although they're not devoid of genes, as I'll show you in a moment. We now have a much more sophisticated understanding of the biochemistry of these alternative forms of packaging. So in this diagram, the little yellow ovals are your nucleosomes. So all the DNA is packaged up in nucleosomes, but there are distinct differences in the post-translational modification of the histone tails. And we find hyperacetylation uh, in regions that are being actively transcribed or are, are accessible for transcription. We find hypoacetylation and particularly methylation of histone 3 on lysine 9 in domains uh, that are associated with heterochromatin proteins and packaged in this form. All right, so now where does the F element come into all this? The F element is a very intriguing um, domain because in a certain sense, it contradicts the definitions I've just given you. <clears throat> so here is our karyotype of Drosophila melanogaster. You have the sex chromosomes, you have two large autosomes, uh, the second, uh, the third, and then this tiny autosome <clears throat> called the F element. So we have to remind our students that there are two kinds of nomenclature when you're looking at a metaphase spread of a Drosophila species. You can uh, simply count the chromosomes and identify the sex chromosomes and autosomes. But if we look over evolutionary time, it's important to distinguish between the different chromosome arms. So we find that all of the genes, for example, in the A arm, tend to evolve together. Um, if you look from one species to it, the next, 90% or more of the same genes will be found on the A element. Same for B, C, D, E. <clears throat> but uh, uh, two arms that form a metacentric chromosome in one species may form telocentric chromosomes in another, that is just be a one-arm chromosome like A is. <clears throat> or they can swap around. So we have given the arms letter names. So this is arm A, B, C, D, E, and our little F element. Now in this figure, the regions that are always packaged as heterochromatin in every cell type uh, are marked in black, whereas the euchromatic domains are marked in gray. And you'll see that the heterochromatic regions are around the centromeres, the Y chromosome and all of that little F chromosome is designated as heterochromatin. 
All right. If we look at a polytene chromosome spread uh, of the Drosophila melanogaster chromosomes, notice in polytene, the heterochromatin is underreplicated and the chromosomes fuse here in a common chromocenter. So all of your heterochromatin tends to be here. Okay. Uh, now, if um, we look at the various characteristics of heterochromatin, late replication, lack of recombination, we see this throughout the F element, no recombination, geneticists hate it, they can't map their genes uh, on the F element. Uh, there is a high repeat density of about 30%, similar to the human genome, uh, and antibody staining of the polytene chromosomes shows high levels of heterochromatin proteins or modifications associated with heterochromatin. So here's our little fourth chromosome, F element. Um, and our comparison region for this study is this region at the base of chromosome arm 3L, which is euchromatic by all these criteria uh, and has a similar number of genes. So that's our reference region on the D element, okay? Um, so fourth chromosome shows these properties but it has 80 genes, and those are important genes. They're all the way from housekeeping genes like RAD23, uh, widely expressed, to specific developmental genes like ILIS. You must express ILIS in appropriate cells at the appropriate time to generate an eye on the fly, okay? And that is a fourth chromosome gene. So we've got genes on, uh, in this domain that are being expressed uh, at normal levels, similar to what you see for genes embedded in euchromatin <clears throat> uh, that play very important roles in the fly. So I've been scratching my head over this one for a long time. How do they manage to do it? How do they overcome the fact that they're in a heterochromatic domain? So we started looking at this um, using comparative genomics to try and understand the organization, evolution, and gene function of F element uh, genes. Uh, because of these unique properties. We think this will give us some insight into how these alternative chromatin states work. And it's also giving us some insight into the evolution of eukaryotic genomes. Our first project was simply to look at these species to see if the F element in species other than melanogaster showed similar organization and similar properties. And the answer was yes. And we published that in 2015 with about 1,000 undergraduate co-authors. <clears throat> we then uh, have gone on to look at this group of species marked in orange. And here we've chosen species that are pretty close to melanogaster, not too far away, um, but uh, not too close. And the hope is that this will help us identify conserved motifs that promote uh, gene expression on the F element, and I'll show you just a couple of slides on that. Uh, we have collected all that data. GEP students have contributed uh, a large number of gene annotations, um, and we're still doing the meta-analysis on that project. And the students are now collecting data on these four species, uh, which will allow us to look at a, a surprising feature of the F element, cases in which it's expanded and it's become a much larger chromosome, no longer a dot, and I'll show you a bit of that. All right, so how do these genes manage to uh, achieve expression within a heterochromatic domain? They've got some mechanism that allows them to open up the transcription start site. This is chip data from modern codes, so chromatin immunoprecipitation data that allows us to map the distribution of a given protein or a given histone modification across the genome. Uh, here we're looking at a meta F element metagene, chromosome 4 metagene, and you can see that all of these silencing marks are depleted at the transcription start site, uh, and we now see for these genes, and we've, we're looking specifically at the genes that are active in this cell type, uh, we see the RNA polymerase and a modification H2K4 methylation that's prominently associated with gene activity. So somehow these genes have managed to kind of elbow aside the nucleosomes and open up the promoter. Now the gene body remains packaged as heterochromatin even while it's being transcribed. The polymerase figures out how to plow right through there. Um, but we think the action is occurring here uh, right at the transcription start site, 
And that has motivated us to ask our GEP students, uh, if they can, to annotate the transcription start site as well as the basic intron exon structure of the gene. We've made some progress in looking for motifs. I'll just give you one example uh, where one of the students used a meme to search for overrepresented sequences uh, in uh, the transcription start site region. And they found this motif. Uh, uh, which occurs at half of the genes on the F element or in chromosome two or three heterochromatin, but only 4% of the genes uh, in um, the euchromatic domains. In a wet bench experiment, we were able to show that adding this little fragment, which has homology to a binding site for topoisomerase two, adding this back to a test reporter gene uh, drives a further expression. And that's shown by moving from a variegated phenotype to a full red phenotype. Now, for those of you that aren't Drosophila officiandos, let me just point out that our reporter gene called white is necessary to get full red eye. I always have to remind the undergraduates that the geneticists always named the mutation. Okay, so if you're a biochemist, you would think this gene should be named red because it has to be active in order to get a full red eye. Uh, but since the, the geneticist named the mutation, they named it white. When this gene is on the fourth chromosome, it is silenced uh, in some of the cells in which it should be active. And that's what gives you the variegating phenotype. We add this little motif back into the promoter region, we can get much higher levels of expression. So we're encouraged about that. There are some, some relevant motifs. We're still doing the meta-analysis to try and piece that story together. Now, our current project, as I mentioned, is F element expansion. Uh, and this is an overview of the project. Actually, let me jump to this next slide and show you the expansion. Uh, you'll remember that in a metaphase squash from melanogaster, the dot chromosome looks just like that, just a dot. And that's true of the majority of the species in the Drosophila uh, lineage. But in a few species, notably Ananesi and Bipectinata, when you look at the metaphase chromosomes, here's the F element. It looks as big as the second or third chromosome looked, looks in uh, that preparation. It is, in fact, about 14 or 15 fold larger than the Melanogaster F. And yet it is the F, it has the same collection of genes. Okay, so this is a little mind boggling. And, and we think if we can understand this, it'll give us some insights also into how eukaryotic genomes as a whole uh, became so large. Now, the basic answer is this high density of repeat elements. Clearly we've been invaded by transposable elements and those elements have amplified on the F element. Let's go back to uh, the uh, project overview here. So what we're working on now is these four species, Ananesi and Bipectinata are about 14 or 15 fold larger F element than Melanogaster. Kikawi and Takahashi are two or three fold larger. We've got some kind of intermediate points and then this large expansion. So it's of interest to know what factors contributed to that expansion, what it looks like and what we've seen so far and what we actually anticipated it is that it is due to invasions of the transposable elements. What's the impact on the gene characteristics, gene size, distribution of repeats in relation to gene structure? And when you get uh, um, expanded genes, which I'll show you, uh, is there an impact in codon bias and so forth? And does that high repeat density promote or allow other changes? Students are finding all kinds of weird things on these chromosomes, pseudogenes, the whole of the mitochondrial genome inserted into uh, the F element, uh, fragments, tandem arrays, and so forth. Having uh, the, the basic data on what these genes look like, what the chromosome looks like, having a good assembly is going to allow us to look at uh, the evolutionary process. In particular, the student data will allow us to look at codon bias and substitution rates, and that will allow us to contrast the impact of the centromere with the impact of simple heterochromatin formation. 
uh, and uh, we'll be able also to uh, go back and circle around and document rate and timing of transposable element acquisition, uh, looking at the question of whether these changes are associated with uh, population size. Uh, this comes into kind of evolutionary genomics. Dr. Chris Ellison, who's a member of GEP at Rutgers, is an expert in this area and will be contributing substantially to that meta-analysis. So back to uh, what we're seeing, the expansion's clearly due to repeats. Uh, when we look at gene expression in these species, like Ananesi, we see no impact. So even though the chromosome's larger, the genes are now surrounded, they're in a milieu of 70 to 80% repeats, uh, they're still being expressed. Boggles my mind. Um, okay, uh, and from the student data on Ananesi, we know <clears throat> that uh, the genes now are much, much larger on Ananesi. So this is the species in which uh, the chromosome is 14 or 15 fold expanded. Here's a, here's a case of a gene that in Melanogaster is 10,000 base pairs, and in Ananesi, it's 483,573 base pairs, <laughs> according to Annabelle. Um, <laughs> That's the primary transcript. Yeah, it kind of boggles the mind. Um, <laughs> These are not easy genes to annotate because look at what you have to, to wade through. So the kids really have to do exon by exon searches, trying to find those exons. As And uh, what's happened, here's the, the uh, genome browser track on repeat masker. Look at that. You know, the whole thing is just about repeats with a few exons here and there. Ah, uh, bizarre. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and then as That's I said, the, the, the kids are also finding um, strange events uh, like this <laughs> occasion where, where the students stumbled on all, in a, a whole copy of the Drosophila mitochondrial genome inserted into the F element. And what's that all about? Uh, I don't know. But we can, from uh, that data, the careful mapping of the exons, we can examine codon bias. And that's very informative. So you know that in, in the genetic code, lots of, of uh, amino acids have multiple codons, four codons, six codons that code for the same thing. And the commonly what we see is that of the six, some are favored. Uh, perhaps there are more tRNA copies for that codon or whatever. Uh, and people look at this by looking at the codons used in the most highly expressed genes. Uh, and uh, what they find uh, is, wait, um, what they find is that, um, I got distracted by family, sorry. Uh, that there's very little codon bias in the F element genes compared to D element. Uh, and you can see that in these plots, which I don't have time to describe in detail. Um, but what it tells you is very little recombination is going on in these domains. Again, um, uh, Laura talked about syntony, uh, and we have found in the past that there is more rearrangement going on on the F element, which is surprising because there's virtually no recombination, but apparently there are inversions. Um, and uh, I remember when we were doing Verilis and the student came up to me and says, I must be doing something wrong. I've got pan next to caps. Uh, and I know in Melanogaster, they're at opposite ends of the chromosome. Well, she wasn't doing anything wrong. There'd been an inversion that brought this one next to this one. And this kind of activity seems to uh, occur at a higher rate on the F, and we'll be interested to see how that plays out in these uh, chromosomes with very high repeats. Okay, so challenges and questions. I think I've, I've really set these up already. Uh, looking at these species with an expanded F, what's the impact on the gene characteristics? This is something the students will be ad addressing directly. Um, and we want them to look around uh, the genes they're annotating and say, does the high repeat density promote or allow other changes? Um, it's clear that it's the transposable elements that are causing this expansion. 
Uh, and when all the student annotation is done, uh, the people in Ellison's lab will be going back and running uh, data analysis to look at the evolutionary history of the transposons. We've got very nice rampage data on these species, which will allow the students to identify the transcription start sites pretty quickly. And so we're encouraging that uh, as well. Okay, I think this coming year, uh, we'll be working on uh, Bipectinata and Kikau. Um, and uh, I should just mention that on the website, uh, we have uh, quite a lot of curriculum and it's better organized this year. We've got in a quick start guide, which shows you the concepts that are being addressed, the tools that are available and uh, the recommended uh, progression for the students uh, as they learn uh, how to annotate and to report on their findings. Um, so this is a project you can tell that I'm <laughs> perplexed about, excited about. I'm, I'm very hopeful that we're going to gain some insights into some of these fundamental issues about eukaryotic genomes.